Welcome to Type C Tech Reviews. Today we're going to be doing a review of the Samsung Odyssey G6. If at any point during the video you want to check out this exact same monitor, there's Amazon links below for the US, UK, Canada, and international links, but let's jump into it. All right, now starting it off, this is a 32 inch panel with a resolution of 2560 by 1440p or 1440p. Now, this has a massive 1000R curve which is probably the most curved you're ever going to get with a monitor. If you like immersion and a curve, well, this is awesome for that. Now, if you don't understand the 1000R, or the R means radius, this is essentially just how curved the monitor is. Now, this totally depends on if it's an ultrawide, that number will completely change. But if it's a 16 by 9 monitor, then that should be fairly standard. So 1000R, the smaller the number, the more curved it is. This is quite curved. Now, most of the time, from everything that I've seen, people either love it or they hate it. Now, I love it for gaming. I love it for watching movies, Netflix, anything. Consuming media or playing games, the curve is amazing, especially if, honestly, it's just you doing it. If you're watching movies with your friend, you better be sitting pretty close. However, for just single person usage, it's awesome. Some people absolutely hate it though and they can't stand it you'll probably know right off the bat just from looking at this if you're going to love it or hate it though. There's no denying how immersive a 1000R curve is and even when farther back, sitting a little bit farther back when watching Netflix or something like that, it's still very nice and immersive. All right, now the PPI or pixels per inch, how crisp and clear the image is actually going to appear to your eye. Now this is 1440p at a 32 inch screen size, which is a pretty large screen. That brings a PPI to about 92 pixels per inch. Now this is relatively similar to what a 24 inch 1080p monitor would be. So if you have any experience with a 1080p 24 inch monitor, that's about what it looks like. Now, personally, I think this looks a little bit clearer to your actual eye because most of the time, a 24 inch monitor is gonna be sitting a little bit closer to you than a 32 inch monitor. So it will seem clearer. It still would be an upgrade as far as usability 90% of the time going from a 1080p 24 inch monitor to this one. But overall, small text will have visible pixelation, but medium text is gonna look good. Most of your images, games, movies will all look clear. Anything that really has motion is very clear. Now, as for the panel type, this is a VA panel. Now, I know what you're thinking, Samsung VA panel? Oh boy, but no, they actually did a pretty dang good job here. Well, actually, a fantastic job here. Now, as for refresh rate, this hits 240 hertz, which is fantastic, but this will consistently switch between 240 and 120 hertz, depending on what you're doing. If you're just doing PC gaming, obviously you're always going to be in 240 hertz, but if you're doing stuff like console gaming, um, which is great on this, then it's gonna be switching obviously to 120 hertz. This has kind of a game mode inside of it. When it's on, it's at 240 hertz, and when it's off, it's gonna be at 120, but we'll get into that. But to be clear, it will never randomly switch. It's always going to be set in whatever setting you set it in. As for variable refresh rate, this has FreeSync Premium Pro. And what the Premium Pro means is that you can have variable refresh rate on with HDR, which is fantastic. That's a nice thing to have. Now, this is not NVIDIA certified with G-Sync, so this is not NVIDIA G-Sync certified compatibility or has that rating of it, but it is very compatible and it works quite well. Does that no noticeable screen tearing or any badness like that? Now let's talk brightness. This is rated for 350 nits in SDR content. Now after testing, I was really hoping that it wasn't gonna only reach 350 nits at this price point, but no, it reached between 400 and 410 nits all day long in a 100% window, which is absolutely fantastic. This is a really good brightness. Most reflections are kept away, although that curve is, well, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. It can keep away a lot of reflections because it's curved, but if you have light coming behind you, either like from these sections, if it's behind like this, well, you better put some blinds up or turn the lights off, although I don't know why lights would be back here, but um, lights from over these directions, not a big deal, because that curve kind of blocks them out, but stuff back here, it's like it will reflect that, <laughs> kind of in that circular pattern because of the curve. However, for the most part, not a big deal with reflections at all, and the vibrancy and overall just prettiness of the display because of the brightness is very good. Images pop, vibrancy is good, and overall the black levels are, well, much better than an IPS panel because this is a VA panel, so you do get those deeper blacks. Now let's talk HDR. The HDR is good, but it's not as good as I hoped for, although 
most of the time in this price range, you're not getting really great HDR performance from brands like Samsung until you bump it up, at which point you get unbelievable HDR performance. But how is it? Well, firstly, there is this thing called Game HDR, which is a setting that you can have it in. You can either have Game HDR on or Game HDR off. With Game HDR off, the overall performance in keeping clarity of the darker and lighter sections of the screen is very, very good, but it's super dim. Like it's in a 100% window, it's getting around 300, 330 nits of brightness. That's low. That's lower than I want to play in. Highlights do not pop out of the screen. Now, when you flip this into game HDR, it way bumps up the brightness. Uh, again, similar to that SDR brightness going 410 nits and above in highlights, definitely in the highlights reaching significantly more than that. However, this also is not tuned really well as it does blow out a lot of the sections of the screen. Without game HDR on, you have no sections that are blown out, handles everything really well, but obviously it's not very bright, so it's not super difficult for that to happen. So in game HDR, some games look better than other games. Like in Battlefield, in the majority of Battlefield, whether that's Battlefield 2042, Battlefield 1, Battlefield 5, those, all of those HDR experiences were very, very good. However, in a game like Forza Horizon 5, it was like not good. Although Forza Horizon 5's HDR experience is not really that great. However, it was bad. You had like zero sky clarity. All of the clouds were completely blown out and there was no detail there. Where in Battlefield with game HDR on, the clouds like maybe some parts of them will get blown out, but the majority of the screen is not. Now game HDR also does increase the saturation of it. However, obviously when you're in HDR, you're taking full advantage of the wider color gamut here and the colors look absolutely stunning. Now in game, especially like Forza, all the Battlefield games, Halo, stuff like that, the games look absolutely amazing because they're super vibrant. It's not too much saturation where it looks unnatural. However, movies may look unnatural with like skin tones, but 95% of the time, it just looked awesome in game, which is great. However, one more thing to mention is that in HDR, the image gets a little bit flat, even in game HDR. And the way that I fixed this and kind of went around this is when in game HDR, there is a setting called contrast enhancer. And don't think that this is like a dynamic contrast thing where it's like constantly changing stuff. No, that's not what this is. This basically just changes around the gamma, I'm pretty sure, and maybe some other stuff. However, setting this from the normal setting or the off setting to low, not high, because there's off, low, and high. Don't set it to off, don't set it to high, set it to low, and the HDR experience is so much better. It actually looks natural, whereas before it looks a little flat. You do those things, turn game HDR on, and then turn that low setting on in the contrast enhancer, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Now, obviously, like I said, in some games it's better than others, but like in Forza Horizon 5 and other games that kind of act or react like that, it's a no-go. I'm not gonna use HDR at all because SDR is just a significantly better experience. HDR in some games is absolutely awesome. You get the deeper blacks because of the VA panel, uh, not OLED level, but deeper than an IPS. And overall, the experience is really good, but in some games, it's downright unusable. All right, but now let's talk colors. We talked about this having a wide color gamut in the HDR section, and it does. It is 95% of the DCI-P3 color space, and it does come factory calibrated from Samsung. How did they do though? That's the big question. How good is their color calibration? Well, accuracy was pretty good, uh, but it's definitely not perfect. However, for like most people, if you're just gaming and you want something that just looks realistic, I mean, this is great. This is exactly what you want. Now, out of the box, color temperature was a little too warm, hitting 7,021 Kelvins with a target of 6,500 Kelvins. That's not crazy, terrible, way too warm. It's just a little bit too warm. Unless you have a trained eye, you're probably not going to notice this unless you have a monitor that's next to it or if you've been using a monitor that has a really good color temperature. But that is a substantial difference. That being said, there's kind of a workaround in the color settings. When I change the color tone preset, which is the color temperature, when I change it from the normal to the natural setting and then tested it in that setting, this hit 6,602 Kelvins. And again, a target of 6,500 Kelvins, which is near perfect. That's basically unnoticeable to 99% of people. Um, that's really, really good. So out of the box, switch this thing into the natural color tone, which is the color temperature, 
and you're good to go. I mean, that's really good. Now, again, that's not gonna make this absolutely perfectly accurate just because of the color tone. You really have to do a full calibration if you want absolute perfect colors, but that's not a massive deal at all. And if you're just a gamer out there who wants a really pretty display, I mean, this has it. For the last thing with colors, this can output 10 bits of colors at full 240 Hertz. As for contrast ratio, this is typical for VA panels hitting 2500 to one. Now this is gonna have significantly deeper blacks, more contrasty than an IPS panel, which is what we want. Now let's talk about local dimming. This has local dimming. It's only vertical edge lit dimming zones. I think there's about 16 of them. That's what I picked up on. Overall, doesn't work the best. There's just not enough zones there. And honestly, it kind of caused a little bit of like, I don't know if it was flickering, but it's just not the best. I don't like the local dimming at all. And I just left it off 90% of the time. It doesn't even do enough anyway. It's not really tuned that well also. And there's only 16 zones. I mean, come on. So local dimming's bad. Now as for backlight bleed, unfortunately my unit did have some and I did purchase this unit personally from Samsung, no relation there. There was a little bit on the top, well, entirely on the top edge, just little bits like that. Uh, and then a little bit in the bottom right corner, not really that much backlight bleed, but I mean, there was backlight bleed. Didn't really notice it during typical usage unless the screen went completely black and then you obviously are gonna see it a little bit, but it wasn't really that noticeable and not a huge problem, but I mean, it's unfortunate at the price point. All right, but now let's move into a new section just for this video, which is scan lines. <laughs> this has them, okay? This has them across the board. I did a review of the Samsung Neo G8, fantastic monitor, had scan lines at 240 hertz, you dropped it to 120 and it didn't have the scan lines. Not the case here, unfortunately you're gonna have scan lines at 240, 120 hertz, or 60 hertz. You're gonna have scan lines if you turn variable refresh rate on or off and have it at any one of those if you turn it to eight bits or 10 bits of color. I check basically everything that I know of, but if you guys know something, if you can figure out how to get the scan lines away off this monitor, comment it below and I'll pin that comment. However, I'm pretty sure that there's no way to really get rid of the scan lines, although dropping it to 120 seemed to decrease the amount like that you can see the scan lines, but they're definitely still there. All right, so what are scan lines? If you don't know, they're horizontal lines um, that you're gonna kind of see on this monitor. They're not like annoying. You're not gonna see it on everything. You typically see it with singular colors. So it's harder to see on gradients, um, but it's easier to see on single colors, especially like lighter reds and deep greens. That's where I think that it's easiest to see the scan lines. The most obvious place I've ever seen it is on the Xbox PC app when I'm clicking on play or install game. You guys know what I'm talking about, that green button. That is where I see scan lines more than anything. For some reason, that shade of green, the Xbox shade of green, uh, makes it really easy to see scan lines. Now, is this a deal breaker? I'm gonna say no, not for me. It might be for you and that's your choice, but for me, it's not. And the reason is, is this is a gaming monitor and not even just like a, oh, it's kind of game. Like it's a gaming, and media content watching monster. That's what it's for. Um, you're not gonna be doing photo and video editing on this. I mean, I wouldn't ever choose a VA panel to do photo and video editing on anyway. And you definitely can, like it's, it's possible, but the scan lines aren't really that big of a deal at all when you're in game or you're watching Netflix or whatever. You just don't notice them in game. Sometimes you will with like, if when you're in game, certain things are absolutely just always there, you might notice them but you're gonna be focusing on the game. You're not gonna be focusing on the scan lines. It's something that you absolutely have to look for. It won't just pop out at you in your peripheral view. It's not that bad. I really only notice it when I'm on desktop and things are not moving at all. They're completely stationary. And again, you have to look for it a little bit. All right, let's talk about one more issue, flickering. I was expecting this to have flickering as you know, Samsung's panels have kind of had issues with that. However, I didn't notice flickering 99% of the time. During a six to eight hour session of continuous usage, I might have seen flickering twice, but it is usually in really weird situations where frame rate kind of changes all like crazy really quickly. But in game, never notice flickering. Watching Netflix, never notice flickering. On desktop, never notice flickering. However, if you do have flickering that is happening, Samsung has a mode called VRR control and that will eliminate the flickering. So there you go. Although that does increase your input lag. So I wouldn't have that on during gaming unless you're getting quite a bit of flickering, which I don't know why you would, but well, there you go. Now response time, ghosting and input lag. Now this is a claimed one millisecond gray to gray response time, but I mean, come on, doesn't really matter. The ghosting is what we care about. How is it? This is a VA panel. It's from Samsung. We don't expect this to be good. 
but it's shockingly good. Way better than I expected. All right, first let's talk about in game mode off, without game mode on, and game mode allows you again to hit 240 hertz, without it on you're hitting 120 hertz. With game mode off and variable refresh rate off, you can go in the fastest response time setting, have no pixel overshooting, inverse ghosting or anything like that, and still very low ghosting. But with game mode on and variable refresh rate on, what you're actually gonna be gaining with, Extreme has pixel overshooting or inverse ghosting, it is very noticeable not the setting I would recommend. However, in the faster setting, which is the middle setting, this is extraordinarily good. I mean, it's really, really good. Some of the lowest ghosting I think I've ever seen on a VA panel, maybe ever. I mean, to the untrained eye, just the person that is a, a gamer, but not a reviewer, and not someone that understands everything really in depth, this is gonna look like a high-end IPS panel to them. Even if they looked at the UFO test, Side by side, they're gonna go, oh yeah, they're pretty much the same, that good. The other interesting thing here is that ghosting with fast whips, not just more of your typical movement, slower pace, but still fast movement, even your very quick whips, you're not getting long lines of smearing. Obviously ghosting is increased regardless of any panel, except maybe an OLED. When you whip quickly, the ghosting is going to increase. However, the smearing on this, even with very fast paced movements, surprisingly good, which is not typical at all for a VA panel. Not sure exactly how they did this, but even though it's super tuned fast, I'm not really seeing any artifacting. A little bit, right? Slight, you can't not have it, but for, I mean, fast paced gaming, FPS, eSports style gaming, competitive gaming. I would have never recommended a VA panel for that before. This is maybe one of the first that I can actually say, yeah, you can do that with this. Incredibly impressive. But let's talk input lag. How is it? Talking about eSports gaming, it's that good. It's incredibly low, like you'd expect, number one, from a 240 hertz panel and number two from Samsung, which they just do very well with input lag. Esports level of input lag, this is absolutely fantastic. All right, now for the menu system and controls, this is gonna be a big section because there's a lot here. This is one of the biggest things with this monitor and a, probably a big reason why you're buying this monitor and if it isn't, it should be, otherwise you should buy something else. This monitor has a built-in OS that they call the Gaming Bar. This has cloud gaming streaming services like built into it that you can just log in and just start gaming. You can hook your different controllers up to the monitor itself. How sick is that? So you have uh, Xbox Game Pass cloud gaming. You have um, Google Stadia, Amazon Luna, GeForce Now, and some others as well. I mean, if you're into cloud gaming, that makes this a all-in-one monitor where you literally can buy the monitor uh, and if you have Game Pass already, you're just gaming on the monitor with zero cables besides a power cable. That's really cool. Now beyond that, this is actually just an OS. Like, a, like it's like a TV. You even have a remote, which we'll talk about. Um, but I believe this is just a derivative or a modified version of Tizen OS, which is Samsung's like OS they have on all their TVs. Um, it doesn't look exactly the same but I think this is actually gonna be like this version, I'm pretty sure is gonna be rolling out on a bunch of different TVs. Really cool that they have it in the monitor because again, this is an OS. You have uh, different channels you can broadcast. You have Netflix, YouTube, all that stuff built in. Apple AirPlay, Bluetooth, all that stuff, craziness. It sounds like, oh my God, that's so stupid. Why would you have that in a monitor? Well, in certain situations, this makes it the perfect monitor. These situations would be if you're a gamer and you're in high school if you're in college in a dorm room, or if you're in a situation where you only have one room or limited space where you're only gonna have one display and that's what you're going to be using most of the time. If you have a single room where you only have a, one room that's your own private room, this is incredible because the panel is big enough at 32 inches, it's big enough where you can watch Netflix on it. You can play games with a controller cloud streaming them from your bed if you wanna do that. And then you can sit down and play PC games absolutely normally like a 240 hertz Samsung monitor should be. I mean, it's just, it just works incredibly well. I mean, this just allows you to buy a singular monitor, a singular display for one room that can do everything. That's really cool and nothing else is doing that in the market. All right, but now the menu system, how is it? It is not easy to use right out of the box. There's a bunch of controls that are not intuitive. However, I love this. After two days, I got completely used to it. I know where everything is. I know how to access it uh, for the most part. It's definitely not the fastest to change settings and all of that, but the flip side of that 
is that you have a ton of different settings, not just all of your normal settings that you would have on every typical monitor, but way more than that. You have a bunch of different, they're definitely not normal settings, they're more like experimental settings. Uh, Samsung has a lot of technology behind them, more so with displays than a lot of other companies. I would say probably most other companies. And because of that, they have a lot of different of these cool settings that just change a bunch of different stuff. So you can really fine tune this display as much as you want, or you can just buy it, set it in a few different modes and just leave it forever. But as a techie, I love going into all these settings. This was really cool. All right, but so inside of that menu system, you have a menu system that's kind of like the OS's menu system that will come up even if you're using your PC, not using the OS. Uh, but in game mode, you'll also have a traditional looking OSD. And then if you wanna go into like your more, that's just for your quick settings. But if you wanna go more in depth, you just click settings through the OSD and then it'll like launch you into that full settings page, which will have a ton of different information. But most of the time, it's pretty easy after you start using it for a few days to get to everything. And it looks pretty, it looks nice. Uh, it doesn't look stupid, except the OSD looks kind of dumb and just like tacked on and weird. But the menu system itself, like the full one, looks great. Now for the controls, you can control this with that one button and then four buttons around it to kind of move around underneath the monitor, although it doesn't work well at all because it's built for the OS. So you have to go through the OS to use this monitor, which may be a negative or it may be a very positive thing. Initially, I was like, this is going to absolutely suck. And it just doesn't once you learn the controls because everything's fast. But the way that you're gonna control this 99% of the time is through a remote they give you. The nice thing, the remote is really nice. It's white, it has these cool rockers for the volume that feel high quality. Everything works quickly. It's very responsive, sometimes slight lag, but it's like quick lag. It's like you click it and it doesn't quite go over and then it like goes over. It's very quick. Uh, most of the time it's extremely responsive, so it doesn't feel sluggish or slow to use. Using the remote also makes it just faster than any other Samsung monitor I've used before. So I can't really complain about that. I mean, yes, you do have a separated remote, but you know, if you have a desk drawer, it's not really that big of a deal. That may be a deal breaker for you, or it may not be. I think it's actually a pro. Also, the remote has a USB Type-C for charging, so it doesn't come with a battery, which is so sick. Obviously, the battery of the remote lasts quite a long time, but you don't have to replace putting it in with that new like dime size battery. That's ridiculous. This one has USB Type-C, which is fantastic. Everyone has a Type-C cable. All right, overall, how is the menu system? Not easy to pick up and use. In two days, you'll probably get it if you're using it a lot, but this is not traditional at all, but it's also one of my favorite menu systems ever because of the massive amount of control that you have over what the monitor is doing. I love that. All right, now the internal speakers. This is something where they definitely did have to do a good job because they have that whole built-in OS and without nice internal speakers, it wouldn't be that good. And they did a really good job here. Now there's no dedicated subwoofer. And so there's no, like, there's not a whole lot of bass, but there is a little bit of bass enough where it's like, oh, that sounds good. The crazy thing here is that the trebles and the mids are really, really clear. Like they're super clear, but they don't sound tinny which is impressive. That's hard to do with monitor speakers. I mean, really, really just very good clarity. Uh, if I'm just playing a campaign game on the weekends when I'm not playing with my friends, I'm just gonna use the speakers. They're that good. Uh, but if I'm gonna play with my friends, I'm just gonna put headset on anyway, because I gotta have that mic. But speakers are really good. Now don't expect you can like bump to music with these, because there's no bass there. You're probably not gonna enjoy listening to music, but like games, YouTube, stuff like that. It's great for that. I'm very happy with this internal speakers. Really good job. Now, as for basic compatibility, if you do wanna mount this, this is compatible with 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter base amounts with an included bracket. So you do have to screw a metal bracket to the back of this monitor, and then you have that 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter base amount. This is also not too hard to mount for the size of 32 inch screen size, because it only weighs 12.1 pounds, which is great. I'll also link below a monitor arm that I recommend. I'll link it below if you do want to end up mounting this. I've extensively tested that monitor arm for, well, like two plus years now. Um, so long-term tests. So if you do want to end up mounting it, I do have one linked below. But let's move on to the standard build quality. Standard build quality here is classic Samsung, which is not a good thing. <laughs> it has great adjustability with height, tilt, swivel, and rotation fully vertical, both to the left and to the right, which is great. But besides that, it's like not good. The stand feels relatively cheap. The build quality of the monitor itself feels relatively cheap. It doesn't look bad at all, but it feels bad. 
if you bump your monitor is going to wobble quite a bit. It's not ever gonna fall over, but it just wobbles. It does not feel like the competition from basically everyone else. It just doesn't feel expensive, which is why you might wanna mount this. Now this also does have RGB on like the two front sections of that thing. You've seen it in the product pictures and all of the B-roll. Uh, and then it has that ring around the back of the stand. Now the ring around the back gets very bright hits the wall uh, and it's easy to adjust the colors. The colors adjust for the front ones and the back one as one. So it's not like Alienware where you can choose every little zone everywhere, but no. So it's like you can control them all together or you can have them off. That's all you get. However, it is super easy in the menu system to change what colors or what, you know, white or red or maroon or yellow. It's like super easy to change all the different colors inside the menu system, which is great. All right, but now the ports. This has one DisplayPort 1.4, two HDMI 2.1s. This is great for consoles if you do wanna do some console gaming. Well, I think that was obvious, but great for console gaming if you want to. One USB Type-B upstream, then two USB Type-A downstreams, a three and a half millimeter audio out, then an ethernet cable. Because again, this has an integrated OS system. So sick and very strange to see an ethernet on a monitor like this. Okay, but that's not it. I mean, I, this technically it is for the ports, but this has Wi-Fi inside of this monitor and it has Bluetooth. So cool, so cool. All right, but price and value. This is a really difficult section because this is a very unique monitor. All right. This retails, the 32 inch screen size, retails for $799.99, which is a lot of money. And the 27 inch retails for $699.99, which is also a lot of money. Definitely, I would get the 32 over the 27 for like $100 difference. But when compared to the competition, it's very difficult because it's very difficult to pinpoint what is the competition and how much do you value all the different stuff this monitor gives you. 240 hertz, perfectly tuned VA panel, a 1000R, and then the OS. And it's like nothing else gives you all of that. Not even close. However, something like the LG 32 GQ850 bumps it up to 260 hertz, 32 inches, it's 1440p, it's IPS, and it's one of the best IPS panels out there. Probably the best high refresh rate, super high refresh rate, 260 hertz IPS panel out there, but that's 1440p. I mean, that's just it. That is an incredibly good IPS panel. But again, that's very different from this monitor. The only real similarity here is you're getting the same resolution and you're getting the same similar refresh rate. Besides that, these are polar opposite. That monitor is something that you can do professional video photo editing on. Uh, the a huge pro with that one is that it doesn't have a matte finish. It has like a hybrid matte glossy finish, which increases the overall picture clarity. However, it doesn't have the deeper blacks and you don't have a curve and it's not immersive like this one is. And you don't have the OS. That one is like, you're gonna game and maybe you're gonna do some content creation or like stuff like that. This one is like a media consuming gaming, so focused on that. Uh, and I love it for that because it does it really well, but that's just going to be a decision that you're gonna have to think about. What are the things that you want? And if the OS system is not something that you want, you have to deal with it to use this monitor. Uh, so it's either gonna be a massive pro or it's gonna be a massive con. So make sure that if you're buying this, you want that OS system. For the price, I would say it's worth it because there's nothing else out there that you can get right now. However, this would obviously be a much better deal if it was on a discount. Definitely be a really, really good value if it does come down because monitors like the LG 32 GQ 850, that one is on sale. Like, oh, it's been on sale since like Black Friday, I think consistently. Really good sales actually. So overall, do I recommend this monitor? Well, if you want one of the best tuned VA panels, great brightness, vibrancy, a 1000R curved, insane usability with a built-in OS and 240 Hertz, then absolutely. But if you don't really need or want an OS and would prefer to not have scan lines, then I recommend the LG 32 GQ 850. Again, if you want to check out either of these monitors or that monitor arm, there is Amazon links below for the US, UK, Canada, and international links. This was a long video. It was an in-depth review. I either love or I hate Samsung monitors. There's pretty much no in between here, but dang, was there a lot to cover and I could have covered even more stuff. This was still just touching the surface of what this monitor, there's like so much tech built into this monitor. It's crazy. If you guys want to check out the unboxing of this video, see what comes in the box, or the setup process, click right there. Or is it right here? One of those sections, that's where the unboxing is, but this was Type-C Tech Reviews, and I'll see you guys in the next video.